All right, I recognize that uh, the, uh, uh, the time right after lunch is always the worst time to speak. Uh, Emilio and I switched uh, because uh, I need to get something done real quick and I'll be back. And, uh, uh, but you just got done eating and now you're sitting down and it's Saturday afternoon and it's not overly bright and I'm not overly bright except for the reflection off my head, and uh, uh, it, it's going to be tough, I realize that. But it was interesting, I was having lunch with, uh, with Emilio and Pastor Pennington, and, and uh, I, I realized that from my perspective, one of the most important texts in this entire discussion has yet to even be mentioned in all the discussion we've had so far. Uh, so that's good because that's left me something to talk about. Uh, that's, uh, actually, there's so many things that we could be talking about on a, on a deeper level uh, as far as some of the te texts are concerned. But turn with me, please, to Matthew chapter 19. And this is sounding like it's just about to feed back on me and pop on me or whatever. Uh, so I'm not sure if that's... And no one's listening to me out there anyways. So... Uh, <coughs> I was uh, taken aback and uh, certainly humbled by how many people put their hands up when the question was asked how many people listened to the dividing line. So I'm, I'm always a little bit uh, under pressure because I'm like, well, if you listen to the dividing line, you've heard all this before. Uh, I mean, uh, I'm the same guy. I do the same thing whether I'm sitting there or not. Uh, and uh, we've, we've gone over this over and over again. But I guess uh, repetition is the mother of memory, as they say. So. Uh, there may be a few folks that are going, what's the dividing line? I have no idea what you're talking about, so we need to talk about these things anyways. But I have often said that if we focus solely upon the negative texts in our presentation of the world of the Christian view on the subject of human sexuality, that we're really missing, I think, uh, the most effective means of communicating what the Bible is actually talking about and, and actually having communication with our with our society. Uh, I don't want to start with Leviticus chapter 18. There's nothing wrong with Leviticus chapter 18. I mean, uh, I, I, I'm still chuckling a little bit at uh, Dr. David Gushy uh, saying that Christians, when, when Christians want to know how to follow Christ, they don't, go to, they don't go to Leviticus. They do things like love God and love your neighbor as yourself. You all know where love thy neighbor as yourself comes from, right? It's Leviticus 19. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, I, 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 when I heard him say that, I was riding, as most of you know, uh, I, was, I, I listened to all this stuff while I'm riding, and I, I, I just about rode off the road. It was like, do you not, do you not know where, where this stuff is coming from? Um, but while there's everything positive to, to know those texts, know their context, know how to present them the proper way, and I appreciated the question and answer period where we could address some of that. If, if I was given the opportunity, which I don't think I ever will be, but if I was given the opportunity to uh, be on CNN or something like that, um, and of course, most of those programs are, how can you put something into it? it it's, the, it's, the, it's like Twitter on television, you know? <laughs> I mean, that's really what it is. Or if you're on, even if you're on with O'Reilly, it's still Twitter on television. You get about 140 characters before he interrupts you. So, uh, you know, and advertises his newest book. So, uh, you know, uh, killing the Volkswagen, whatever he's come up with next, I, I, I don't know. But uh, it, it, it's, if, if I had the opportunity and someone were to say, why do you believe what you, why are you so bigoted? You know, if someone is, and that's really what's going on, and my understanding is on the, on the Sunday talk shows, I didn't see it, but um, one of the heads of one of the, the Christian organizations was on uh, one of the major to Sunday talk shows, and, and it was an ambush, and uh, uh, Schieffer, Bill, is it Bill Schieffer? What's the guy in CBS? Bob Schieffer, thank you. Uh, went after this guy about being, you know, you're the head of one of the major... Uh, uh, hate groups, anti-gay hate groups, you know, and stuff like this. I don't even know that I would take the opportunity, but if I were, where would I start? If someone were to say to me something along the lines of, well, 
you, you know, Jesus would never have been, Jesus never said anything about homosexuality. Why are you such, why are you so bigoted, et cetera, et cetera. I think my response would be something along the lines of to Mr. Uh, Mr. Schaefer, uh, Schaefer, whatever his name is, I would say, why is it that you want to demand that I disrespect and stop following Jesus Christ? That would normally give me at least a few seconds because he'd be like, huh? What, what, what? I'm not used to a Christian fighting back and putting me in a position of having to answer for what I'm doing. What, what's going on here? And then in that few seconds that you've just purchased yourself, I would somehow try to summarize Jesus' positive teaching in Matthew chapter 19. How many times have you heard someone say, well, Jesus never said anything about homosexuality? If you hear anyone say, Jesus never said anything about homosexuality, you are talking to an exceptionally ignorant person. Now, by the way, that's not an insult. That's an observation. If you can honestly look at the full body of Jesus' teaching, see what he taught about the law, put him in his proper context, recognize what Judaism looked like in that day, if you can do all of that and not come to the realization that Jesus said a lot of things about homosexuality or anything else because he affirmed the entirety of God's law. He did not try to introduce some new ethic that went against God's law. If anything, he took their understanding of it and, and made it even deeper. You have heard it said to you, but I say to you, and he takes it even farther into the very essence of the person's heart. There is absolutely no way that you can look at Jesus' teaching and go, oh yes, he would have, Jesus would have us to affirm the redefinition of marriage. He would have us to affirm um, all the new genders that no one had ever thought of until this current generation. Yeah, he would have us to affirm all of that. I, I don't know how anyone can, can ask to be taken seriously that would make that kind of a statement. And so I would try to go to Matthew chapter 19. And if you have opportunity on the on the plane, on the bus, uh, whatever the situation is, it would seem to me that providing a positive teaching from the lips of Jesus. Now look, we can find positive teachings from the Apostle Paul, but of course Paul gets the bad rap of being the terrible, horrible, nasty, anti-woman, anti-this, anti-that type guy. There's still sort of a general cultural willingness to sort of grudgingly give Jesus a, a little bit of credit. And so introducing folks to what Jesus himself said on this subject, I think, would be one of the most valuable things you can do. So notice, chapter 19, verse 3, some Pharisees came to Jesus, testing him and asking, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? And he answered and said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Now, of course, they then respond to that because what they were trying to do here, of course, is they were trying to get Jesus in the middle of the current raging debate of the day. Uh, we can confirm, it's interesting uh, that we can confirm this from external uh, sources outside the Bible, that, that there were two major schools of thought, uh, the, the rabbinic schools of Shammai and Hillel, and they were constantly arguing about this issue of divorce and what the proper grounds for it were. And one side, this is really, this is, really the, the position taken by one side for any reason at all. You could divorce your wife for any reason at all. Uh, she, she burns the toast, she's gone. Uh, she burns toast, she's toast. Uh, wh wh whatever it might be, any, anything that a man felt was, uh, was inappropriate in his wife, he could give her a writ of divorce and move on to someone else. And the other side said, no, 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 there is, there is, there's specific limitations. And this was a great divorce, great, the great divorce debate that was going on. And so they were trying to corner Jesus in, and put him in, in a certain part of their little small debate universe. And Jesus' answer, however, gives us a positive understanding of what the incarnate Son of God believed concerning 
human sexuality and marriage? And he answered and said, have you not read? Now, isn't it interesting? When I started into Leviticus 18, I immediately stopped and said what? How you come down on this entire issue will really be dependent upon whether you believe that Yahweh said to Moses these words. Well, what is it that he's quoting from? He's quoting from Genesis. Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? Now, it's interesting. Jesus didn't stop and go, now we have the first creation story, then we have the second creation story. And they're contradictory stories, you see, so we really can't take them overly seriously. How many of you heard that the, uh, the debate that took place last weekend, uh, a, week, a weekend ago, on the unbelievable radio broadcast between Robert Gagnon and a, uh, a lesbian Episcopalian, Ang Anglican, Anglican, sorry. One, two, two folks, three folks, okay. Um, how many of you are going to go Google unbelievable and Rob Gagnon? Very good, all right. Um, <laughs> I've been on the Unbelievable program, I don't know, what, 12, 14 times, something like that over the years. Um, and before you, you jump on Justin Brierley for being Justin Brierley, please remember, uh, I could not survive being a talk show host in the United Kingdom with the pressures that are put upon them to just try to stay on the air. So, so cut them a little bit of slack given uh, that England is a, f a few years down the road from, from where we are. Be that as it may, um, there was a fascinating exchange between Bob Gagnon, who is really the leading scholar in this field. Uh, his book on this subject is dense, it is thick, it's not easy to read, it's not enjoyable to read, but it is the source book. Uh, he has done his homework and is willing to defend his homework. And the Anglican lesbian woman that he was on with, I noted a number of times, uh, when Bob Gagnon would talk about the creation sequence, the creation uh, ordinances, she's like, well, you know, it depends on which of the creation stories we're talking about, you see. And if you quote from Isaiah, well, that, that's from Deutero Isaiah. And, and there was this constant little, it wasn't a major theme, but it was an, a constant undercutting of the authority of Scripture. And I just, I just wonder if what Jesus' response would have been if one of the Pharisees had responded going, well, but that's from the second story of creation and there's two of them and they're contradictory. I'm not sure if the earth would have opened up and swallowed them, uh, <laughs> fire from heaven, both at the same time would have been very, very interesting, um, but that's not what happened. And it's amazing how many people today will dismiss Jesus' response simply because they recognize that, well, this, this can't be the Jesus that we want because he, he goes back to the creation story and he, he seems to believe it actually happened. I've got really bad news for you if you're in that camp. He not only believes it happened, he thinks he's the God who did it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? Now, I don't know what else you can get out of that. The first thing is, the reason we're having the problem we're having in our society is that the vast majority of people in our society do not believe that they have a creator any longer. There is a fundamental, I'm going to try to get this thing out of the way so I don't pop it all the time. There is a fundamental difference in a people who believe that there is a God who made them and to whom they will be answerable. There's a fundamental difference between that type of a people and a people who believe that they are nothing but a cosmic accident. They have no intrinsic purpose and they certainly are never going to have a responsibility to answer to their creator. It took Darwin a long time to get us to this level of confusion about ourselves. What's happening today could never, ever, ever happen if you had not had Darwin and the rise of neo-Darwinian micromutational evolutionary theory. It couldn't happen. 
Because up till that point in time, everybody recognized, well, there's male and female because God made us that way, and therefore there is a purpose in it. Not that, well, we just happen to be in a certain line of evolutionary development that uh, is binary in its uh, reproductive, uh, and that's, there's nothing really good or bad, there's no purpose for it, it's just the way that it is, and so it doesn't really matter. And you put it all together with the fact that man's mind is nothing more than chemicals fizzing and interacting with each other, and, 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 and therefore if your, your chemicals fizz one way to where you are I can't, even, I, I can't even bring myself to memorize. How many, how many Facebook genders were there at one point they were offering? Like 38 or some, something like that. And so you've got, you've got questioning and you've got free spirit. <laughs> that sounds like some kind of aftershave or something. I mean, uh, you know, you, you, you've got all this different kind of stuff. But hey, if it's all just how your chemicals fizz versus somebody else's chemicals, it doesn't matter, right? It just doesn't matter. We could never have gotten here as long as we continued believing in what Jesus said, and that is that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female. That wasn't a mistake. It's beautiful. It's right. We live in a land today where little boys are being feminized and little girls are being masculinized. I, it, is, it amazes me that they are kicking kids out of school for chasing each other around the playground going pew, 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 pew. I did that, I didn't become a mass murderer somehow. I am so thankful that my, I, I get to watch my little granddaughter on FaceTime. Uh, FaceTime is, was, FaceTime was developed by a grandparent. Just so you know. Because I don't know how grandparents survive before FaceTime. I really don't. What'd you get? Some Polaroids in the, in, the, in the mail two weeks later? I mean, that is not enough, okay? And I don't know if any of you follow me on Facebook, but uh, my daughter uh, put up a, a picture just yesterday. And the story behind it was that Clementine, my little granddaughter, likes to try to make a funny face when, when calling grandpa on FaceTime. So when a screen comes up, she's making a funny face. Uh, and she sent this adorable picture and Summer was saying, unfortunately, she has my poker face. So in other words, she couldn't hold it long enough. She was already laughing by the time that it came up, and she took a screenshot of it. And it's, it's adorable. And I look at that little girl, and she's going to be, I'm going to be a, a granddad again uh, this year. And uh, she knows that another one's coming. And so she's practicing feeding babies. And there's one picture of her with her bear, and she's putting a diaper on the bear and uh, all the rest of that kind of stuff. And you know what? That's good. But there are people in our society that think that's bad. Because you're stereotyping. You better believe it. <laughs> Guess what? We need mommies, and mommies are good. <laughs> now, I happen to think it's going to be a boy, by the way. <laughs> uh, last name is Pinch, so I was thinking about something like Zechariah Isaiah Pinch. Zip. That'd be sort of funny to say. <laughs> Zip. Here's Zip. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't think that's going to happen, but uh, I don't really have any control over that. Anyway, God has a purpose for maleness and femaleness, and it is a rebellion against God's creative purpose to say what Bruce Jenner said last weekend. That is sin, that is rebellion, and, and you don't have to say that to Bruce Jenner by saying, I'm holy and you're not. We're all broken sexually, but somebody needs to be honest enough to say to people in that situation that what is being offered to you is a lie. Those who go through sex change operations are four times more likely to commit suicide because they, they discover the idea of transitioning is a lie. You can't do it. It's, 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 it's fake. It's not real. It's an empty promise. It's a lie. And it's rebellion against God. God made you the way you are. And you say, but, but, but I feel differently. You don't get to define reality. God does. I thought that was something we all learned when we grew up. Isn't that one of the major things you learn when you, when you mature? is that 
To be mature is to be a person who can recognize the world's not always going to bend to me. So I need to make the best of what I find in the world. Isn't that what maturity is? We have a very immature world around us. God made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So, so Jesus expects that his hearers have listened to what the word of God says. He quotes from the entire Genesis narrative, accepts it as the very words of God, accepts it as, as expressing God's purposes and God's truth, and now he says to them, you should have seen this as your fundamental foundation for understanding this question. Not your traditions, not your rabbis. This is where you should have begun. And what we find here is the very paradigm of what the family is to look like. A man shall leave his father and mother. Now, immediately people say, oh, but, but sometimes things happen. There are tragedies. There's war to where the father dies. Yes. Very often in those days, the mother might die in childbirth, giving birth to another sibling. Yes. And that's why there's so much in the scriptures about orphans, about taking care of the fatherless or the motherless. There's a whole bunch about that because, yeah, we live in a fallen world. But the exception does not disprove the central reality of what God teaches concerning the nature of the family. A man shall leave his father and mother, and it is sinful. It is sinful to approve of a situation where purposefully you are depriving a young person of both examples. If it happens in the providence of God, the community comes together and, and, and attempts to make up for that. But when you call it good to force a child to be fatherless or to force a child to be motherless and that that's a good thing, that's something we should celebrate, that is horrific. It is sinful. A man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. While it is obvious that there is more to the union of a husband and wife than the sexual union, it is also obvious that it is not less than that, that it includes that, and that that union which gives rise to life, the life that the fa father and mother beforehand, where do you think the son came from? From that, that propagation of the species that is the natural, beautiful, positive result of a man and woman com coming together, that is part and parcel of what is in view here. Does it go beyond that? Of course it does. But you cannot take that out. And it's amazing how many people are trying to find some way of saying, well, you know, that's really not a, a, a definitional aspect of what Jesus is talking about. Of course it is. In fact, when it talks about the two becoming one flesh, how does Jesus interpret this? Verse 6, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. So his interpretation of the text that he expected his audience to know and he held them accountable for was that the union that comes about between a man and a woman makes them one flesh. They're no longer two, but they have become one flesh and that this is an act of God. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. God blesses marriage because God ordained marriage. And you see, as long as, and we have all been influenced by the world in which we live. Everyone in here. I was a biology major in college. I understand evolutionary theory. From the time I was in junior high and high school, um, I was in constant battle with my teachers on this particular subject. Uh, I had one particular teacher who I liked a lot. In fact, I, I had him for his first year teaching biology. 
my daughter had him for his last year teaching biology. And I really liked the gentleman. And we would sit at lunch and we would debate the issue of creation and evolution. And he would, he would uh, copy off uh, research articles from journals for me to read on the subject of genetics and, and all that type of stuff. And even when I went to a Christian college, I was the only creationist in the biology department of my Christian college. And so the battle continued on an even higher level at that point, uh, even, even at a Christian college. And so I understand how neo-Darwinian micromutational evolutionary theory doesn't work. Uh, I know how it's supposed to work. Uh, I've read enough Dawkins to have figured all of that stuff out fairly well. And so I have that, that background. And so it is natural for me to look at the male-female thing and go, well, yeah, it's, it's pretty common. It's pretty common standard method of reproduction in the animal kingdom. And then what you do is you just simply translate that up to human experience and so, well, you know, that, that, that's all there is to it. Until I had a child anyways. And then you realize if that's all you ever see, if, if you are limited to seeing that on the level of, of Darwin, well, all I can say is I wouldn't want to be your kid because there's so much more to it. And it's funny thing is Dawkins knows that. It's funny to watch how Dawkins has to be more of a father than his worldview could ever allow him to be. You notice that? They can never live consistently with their worldview. They really can't. There's more to it than that. God joins together the man and the woman because God has given that to us. And I have been changed by my wife. She has been changed by me. That's a good and positive thing. But in case anyone hasn't noticed this, maybe there's some single guys, some single gals in the, in the audience today. A few of you out there? Okay, all right. But there's a real difference between men and women. And if you don't know that before you get married, you will find out very quickly after getting married. <laughs> and it's not just physical difference. Guys, they think differently than we do. <laughs> yeah. They want us to do certain things that we don't want to do. And they don't want us doing things that we want to do. Which is probably why when you, when you look at guys that are out in the streets, gangbangers doing graffiti and stuff like that, most of them are not married with children at home. <laughs> you notice that? Yeah, yeah. But notice something. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Now that was his answer to the divorce question. His answer was to say, you're both wrong. You've both missed it, which is why they bring up the issue of divorce and the hardness of your heart and so on and so forth. And, and Jesus points them to a much higher understanding of, uh, of even Moses' law. But here's the important part. The union that God joins together is a man and a woman. It is never a man and a man or a woman and a woman. And yet today, in the minds of many, that's exactly what this text would have to say. And in fact, I can guarantee you, haven't seen it yet, but I could find you if I looked hard enough. Some people pretending to be biblical scholars who would say, now we shouldn't limit this text as traditionalists have done in the past to merely a recognition of the blessing of God upon a heterosexual union. But we should recognize that as long as any two people are in love with one another and are committed to one another, then God would bless their union and join them together. There is no question about the fact that no one, absolutely, positively no one in the days of Jesus, 
was promoting this as a moral good. No one amongst the Jews, no one in the community that Jesus would have walked through and taught in had ever even given it a second thought. And as I said during the q and I've often asked, wanted to ask the gay Christian advocates, what do you do with Jesus? Because if he was on your side, here was his opportunity. If he really did believe that one out of 25 or one out of 20 of the people standing in front of him were, were repressed homosexuals that wanted nothing more than to have monogamous, lifelong, covenantal relationships with just one other person of the same sex, which represents a tiny percentage of the homosexual experience, as Brother Pennington pointed out just recently uh, in regards to some of the statistics he shared with us. But if he knew that, if he knew what is being presented to us, here was his opportunity. And yet, what does he do? From their perspective, the only way that I could possibly see how you could express it is he absolutely restates the status quo. And in fact, makes it even worse because he now says this is absolutely lifelong. It, you, you guys aren't even asking the right question. He says nothing to bring relief or freedom to one twentieth of his audience. And that's why they have to come up with a view of Jesus other than the view of Jesus found in Scripture. Now, all of this, all of Jesus' teaching is based upon a worldview that used to be, even if it was not lived consistently, could be taken as a given on the part of most of the people that we are speaking with. But the reason we are seeing the massive earthquake in morality and ethics in our day is because we finally have the next generation coming up that have been thoroughly secularized. They're finally far enough removed from those generations that were soaked in a, in a biblical Christian worldview, even if they themselves weren't Christians, that they're willing to throw off all the restraints that that other worldview had held them under. And so we can no longer assume that they have any familiarity with the Bible or any respect for the Bible. In fact, now we can begin to assume, thanks to Bart Ehrman and people like that, that they will have a disrespect for the Bible and will throw questions out about the accuracy of its transmission or, or issues along those lines. So that's what we are, are facing in this particular situation that is our world today. But when we have opportunity, I want to be able to go to this text and say, what you are telling me, Mr. Bob Schieffer, what you're telling me is that I cannot follow the Jesus who rose from the dead. What you're telling me is that I cannot bow the knee to him and believe what he taught here because what he taught here is fundamentally contradictory to what you're telling me I must believe to be a non-bigoted, non-discriminatory good person. In fact, Mr. Schieffer, do you think Jesus was a good person? Do you think that his teaching on this subject would be considered good today? Because he said that only a man and a woman, their union is what is blessed by God. Their union becoming together as one flesh is a man and a woman. It's never two men. It's never two women. Jesus never said a single positive word about what you're telling me I must celebrate as a Christian to be good. So, Mr. Schieffer, aren't you telling me that I need to cease being a Christian? When did you become an anti-Christian bigot, sir? <laughs> now, I would be careful in using that line of argumentation because if the person you're talking to is as big as my brother right over here and towers over you, you might find yourself waking up in the middle of next week. <laughs> but there are some times, there are some contexts 
where it would be appropriate to absolutely take the shoe that they're trying to force on your foot and stick it on their head and say, wait a minute, you want to call me a bigot? You want to say that I'm bigoted? What is a bigot? A bigot is a person that without examination of the facts and the context of an issue comes to a conclusion in a thoughtless manner that is based primarily upon some kind of predilection or some kind of bias. And it sounds to me like you're the one doing that. It sounds to me like we have a lot of anti-Christian bigots in the media today and in our society. And so by coming back and saying, here's the positive teaching of Jesus, the positive teaching of Jesus, this is what marriage is, this is what uh, gender is, this is what God's purpose in all of these things are. And we can, we can go beyond this, of course. I'm, I'm hoping you're, as you're listening to this, you're thinking of Ephesians 5 and you're thinking of all these other texts in the Bible where, I mean, just the idea of, of comparing Jesus and his bride, Jesus and the church, should automatically make you, going, make you think, wow, it, it obviously could never be Jesus and Jesus. And it could never be the church and the church. There's something fundamentally different about Jesus and the church that, that describes the beauty of that relationship in the first place. And what absurdity to think of, of Jesus with Jesus or the church with the church. And yet that's the absurdity of thinking of male with male and female with female. It is, as I've said, falling in love with a mirror image. And falling in love with a mirror image, well, there's a story from Greek mythology about that. Remember, it's called narcissism. And a guy fell in love with his own reflection. And we call someone who loves themselves in that way a, a narcissist. But there is something very narcissistic about homosexual desire. Jesus would have none of that. He did not substantiate any of that. And we are being told that we, in essence, must abandon what we have been taught. Now, one the, one, when you're... My assumption is, if you're, if you're attending a conference like this, is that a lot of you are individuals who have a desire to be able to communicate with people in our, in our culture. You want to take this, you don't want to just go, hmm, good notes, I'm ready, and I'm going to keep this to myself. Okay? You want to be able to, without being a jerk and without, uh, you know, I, I hope nobody's planning on getting on their white horse and heading out to, you know, the local gay bars this afternoon or something like that. And uh, I've got a message for you. Uh, please, please don't uh, say that that's what we were intending for you to do. But if you are individuals who want to have the opportunity to have a word of testimony, then what you always want to be thinking about whenever you get into any conversation with anybody on any apologetic subject is where do I want to be at the end of this conversation? If I'm only going to have 10 minutes, that's going to change what my goal is going to be. If I'm going to have longer than that, then I can, I can try to shoot for a higher level or whatever else it might be. But if you're going to engage this subject, and sometimes you don't even get to think ahead. It's just going to hit you out of nowhere. You're sitting at a, at a gate at the airport. You're reading a book, and the person next to you engages you, and boom, you're into it. Okay, no preparation. Well, hopefully you've had some preparation, actually. But uh, whenever, whatever it is, you want to be thinking about what do I want this person to walk away with? What is the end game here? Don't just wander into it and then you'll end up covering this and that. And by the time you get done, it's like, well, we didn't really get anywhere. We talked about you know, three dozen different things. We didn't really accomplish anything. If you don't have a goal when you start, guess what? You won't get there. And so you need to have a goal. And even if you've gone through Matthew chapter 19, as you look at this, you might go, there's a lot of different places this could lead me. There's a lot of different uh, directions that I could go with this. I mean, you could go directly into a gospel presentation. You can talk about the authority of Jesus Christ. You can use this to transition into uh, Jesus talking about himself as the way, the truth, and the life. Can you imagine someone saying these things? Well, where do you get his authority? Well, it's because he's the incarnate son of God. It's because he's come to get... There's lots of directions you could go. One direction that you might want to go is if they find the discussion of the male and female and God's creative order, you might want to say, well, you know, it's interesting. Why don't we go back and look at what Jesus clearly thought was 
the Word of God. So turn with me back to Genesis chapter 1. And we know, beginning, for example, in verse 4, then God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures, verse 24, after their kind, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth after their kind. And it was so. God made the beasts of the earth after their kind, the cattle after their kind, and everything that creeps on the ground after its kind. And God saw that it was good. This is not a purposeless process going on. God is creating a universe that is good. It is pleasing in his sight. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And so God creates man, and he creates man, male and female, and he creates them in his image. But we know the story is not done at that point in time. It's not that you have some new story. It's not that you have a contradictory account, and people in the old world, in the ancient world, were just horrible editors, and so they go, oh, I don't know how to put these together. Let's just slap them together and not worry about it. You can get a PhD in Old Testament believing that, but other than that, it doesn't really help actually handling the Word of God. And so you go into chapter 2, and you have more of a discussion of what takes place, and, and you have the man, and the Lord God takes him and, and puts him in the Garden of Eden. And then in verse 18, we have, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Now, may I suggest something to you? One of the sad, sad things about the deception of homosexuality is that it offers to people the idea of lifelong, lifelong companionship that actually leaves them alone because the companionship they're seeking can never fulfill the description that is made here. Many of you have heard what the Hebrew phrase is, Eitzer Konegdo, Eitzer Konegdo, a helper suitable or corresponding to him. It's a fascinating phrase because in light of what has come before, and Adam seeing the animals, and you know what well, actually comes after this because it talks about how he brings all the animals and and uh, and he names them, and then it says in verse uh, twenty, but for Adam there was not found a helper suitable for him. Why? Because there were no there were no humans there. So one of the absolutely necessary aspects of an Aetzer Konegdo is that we're of the same species. Well, that's pretty obvious, isn't it? Well, not to some people, unfortunately. But there is a sameness in the Aetzer Konegdo, but there is also a different element that allows there to be correspondence. It, it gives you both. We're both human beings. We both share the image of God. And yet... The one has attributes and characteristics, not just, I would argue, physical, though those are obvious and unquestionable, but has attributes, physical, spiritual, and mental, that are different from, opposite from, while remaining corresponding to. That's what the woman is. And what the man is to the woman in reverse. And so here you have the very same text that Jesus is quoting from, that Jesus believes to be scripture, that Jesus believes to be the revelation of God, that he quotes from himself and holds men accountable to, saying that there is a correspondence, there is a complementarianism, 
that the man compliments the woman, the woman compliments the man. And every one of those promoting the gay Christian movement have had to start their books with an attack upon that very truth. If you read Brownson's book, the first few chapters are all an attack upon complementarianism. An egalitarian church has, has no grounds, none outside of mere tradition for resisting the movement of the homosexual movement in, amongst their people, none. If you can't tell the difference between men and women, if you can't tell that God has a purpose in that and it's a good and holy and just purpose, you're not gonna get anywhere in trying to stand against this movement within our society. There is a correspondence, and that's why, that's why James, you know, James Brownson spent more time trying to attack that in his book than he did trying to deal with any of the major texts whatsoever in regards to the subject of homosexuality. Because he recognizes once you can make that foundational change, the rest is all going to follow after. And so Jesus believes that this text tells us that there is something purposefully designed by God. And notice he, he, he belabors this in Genesis 1 and 2. The scriptures belabor this. I mean, you have the general statement of the creation of, of, of man as male and female, but now you then have the, the restatement of this so that we have it emphasized to us that the woman was created later because without her, it was not good to just be man. It is not good. All the other animals, they were fine, happy. But God delays the bringing into existence of the female in this one situation. Why? Well, I can't give you all the reasons. I'm not going to try to read God's mind here, but I can tell you one thing. Down through the centuries, when there have been debates, believe it or not, amongst people as to whether women have souls or not, when in many religions the testimony of the woman is less than the testimony of the man and all these other types of things, there has never been a basis for anyone who took seriously the Bible to question the grandeur, glory, worth, and equality of the woman before God. Never. Just simply because you can recognize that God has different purposes in men and women. Any man who ever took seriously the revelation of Scripture would always be reminded it was not good for man to be alone. He needed something, just as she therefore recognizes her need for that one who corresponds to her. There is no basis in the Scripture for the allegation that, well, Christianity puts women down, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's been lots that's called itself Christianity. It's done a lot of stupid things in the past. But if you're talking about what the Bible actually says, it is amazing that back in the days when women were treated as chattel property, you have this at the very beginning of the Scriptures. That both are created in the image of God and that it's not good for man to be alone. And that the woman is an Eitzer Konegdo, one who corresponds to. There is something beautiful in that that simply can never exist when you deny God's right to define the role of the genders. And it robs from man and it robs from woman the beautiful life-affirming relationships that are possible only when we will take seriously what God says. And immediately people say, oh yeah, but look at how many people have abused marriage. I know. How does that take away their guilt? How does that change the reality that what God has said is this is what I've intended for my creation? Does that give you the right to say that God got it wrong from the start just because there has been abuse of it because of the issue of sin? You've missed the whole point of the whole story arc of the Bible, that God heals all of that. He doesn't heal all of that by getting rid of what he made beautiful in the first place. And he doesn't give us the right to redefine those things. He doesn't give us the right to redefine those things.
when he makes this suitable helper for, helper for man, he takes from his side. She is, he is Ish, she is Isha, both made in the image of God, corresponding to one another. God blesses the union. And woe be to any people who think themselves wiser than God to try to redefine that. I still pray that God will have mercy on Justice Kennedy. Because you and I both know those other four justices. Well, I suppose God could put in appearance. That would be about the only thing that might cause at least one of them I can think of to change her vote. But we can hope and pray that God will have mercy. And I'm going to continue praying. And you say, well, what if it doesn't happen? Will you be disappointed? You think God can't do it? No. I want to express to God my desire. I don't want to see the destruction of my nation. I really don't. And if God allows us to continue down that path, I will seek to be faithful in warning of what is to come. But our job now is to pray. God, protect us from evil men and women. Protect us from evil rulers. Protect us from evil judges. Restrain the hearts of men. Cause them to seek your truth. And I would hope and pray that God would be merciful to us at this time on this issue. Because the union of man and woman... God intended from the beginning. From the beginning, he made them male and female. That's his purpose. That's his intention. And we destroy ourselves and those around us when we rebel against his intention. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we do pray for our nation. We pray that even this day, by your spirit, you would grant understanding that you would soften hearts Lord, that you would restrain evil. Lord, we know that redefining marriage will be destructive in the lives of so many. That redefining marriage will indeed bring death rather than life. And so, Lord, we would pray that by your spirit, you would show yourself powerful. Lord, we would pray that you would restrain the madness of those who would seek to overthrow that which you've given to us, which is good and lovely and pure. Lord, we know we do not deserve this grace from your hands. We know that we deserve whatever your justice would demand, for we have had so much light and so much blessing in this place. But Lord, we throw ourselves upon your mercy and ask that you would indeed help people to understand what your word says. And whatever happens, Lord, we desire to be faithful to you. We desire to honor and glorify you. Thank you indeed for this day. As we think on these things, may you make us better servants of Jesus Christ, for it is in his name that we pray.